So this week on Koei Nature, I'm going to show you how to identify your feathers in the field using two cool databases. One of them being Feather Atlas. Also, let's not get arrested. That'll be a good thing. Let's learn some things about feathers as well. We see these beautiful birds around us all the time. And sometimes they leave us little treasures that make us wonder, hmm, who did this belong to? Identifying feathers can be a tricky task, but I know you can do it even as a rookie feather identifier and have some fun along the way. Hey everyone, I am Koa, and you may be wondering what happened to my set. If you're a returning viewer, I'm moving to the office. It's sort of cleared out. This week, we'll identify four different feathers I recently found. It's going to be a really fun adventure of discovery. I'll even tell you how feather experts will help you confirm your identification or maybe suggest your feather belongs to another species. And guess what? It's all free. Do you hear a crowd cheering too? First and foremost, I want you to know that birds are protected in the United States and Canada by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act of 1918. It is illegal to take feathers with you and there are very few exceptions. It's fairly strict and includes most all birds in North America. You can't keep the feathers off a bird that hits your window or even a feather you find walk around your neighborhood. And the community here at Koa Nature not only enjoys the outdoors, but we respect nature and therefore we want to respect the laws that are set to protect our native species and wildlife in general. So let's do that. Plus, I don't want you to get fined. That would be bad. And of course, CITES protects endangered species internationally. Let's get a little familiar with the first database we will use, Feather Atlas, that was created by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services Forensics Laboratory, our good old tax dollars at work. Here you can use their Identify Feather tool that uses five criteria, pattern, color, size, position, and type of bird. And you don't have to submit information into each criterion, but obviously the more you know, the easier the ID will be. Feather Atlas lists just over 400 species of North American birds that are cataloged with really detailed and accurate photos of feathers and their positioning on the birds. Feather Atlas will keep adding species to this very cool and impressive database. You'll notice that feathers vary in size and color and other features depending on many variables like positioning on a bird or sex of the bird. And as we know, many birds change plumage as they mature, and even change their plumage seasonally. Sexual dimorphism is also very common among avian species, where males and females have different feather characteristics. Feather Atlas lists the primary, secondary, and tail feathers for most species. And you may be wondering what those are, so let's do a quick examination of some basic flight feather positioning. The primaries are the outer flight feathers. Most birds have 9 or 10. The secondaries are the inner flight feathers that can vary from 9 to 25 depending on the bird type. Those tertials there are the innermost flight feathers, normally 3 to 4 in number. Together, the primaries, secondaries, and tertials make up the remiges, or all the flight feathers of the wing. The singular of remiges is remex. So one primary feather would be called a remex, and a secondary feather would be called a remex. Tail feathers are also listed in the database. These flight feathers of the tail are also known as rectrices, sometimes pronounced as rectrices. The singular of rectrices is rectrix. So one flight feather of the tail is known as a rectrix. The remiges and rectrices are the bird's flight feathers that provide the lift and maneuverability and what will be easiest to identify in the field. Of course, there are other feather types all over a bird's body, but we won't get into that here. With many of the feathers on, say, the breast, you'd need a microscope to look at the microscopic properties of the barbules to identify what species it belongs to, and we aren't gonna take it to that level. Now, before you head out into the field looking for feathers, I suggest making a backdrop. This will help with the sizing and contrast of the photos you're gonna take. Yes, you need to take some photos with your phone, because remember, you can't take these feathers with you. They are under protection by federal law. So I've just grabbed a single piece of white paper and measured out a simple X and Y axis in centimeters. Yes, for my fellow compatriots using the imperial measuring system, you may be like, centimeters? Why can't I use inches, bro? Let me tell you why. 
Well, that's because science uses the metric system as well as most other countries in the world. So using centimeters on your chart will save you time from having to conjure up conversions later on. Trust me, you'll thank me and be like, oh, I should have subscribed to that wonderful Koa Nature channel when I was watching that video. I've also laminated mine with some packaging tape because if you are like me in the field, you're often getting wet and dirty and it's probably greener to make a sturdy one of these rather than many more of them over time. And that Koa Nature sticker just looks a bit prettier, don't you think? Also, keep in mind that some feathers do get quite large, like this female bald eagle has a feather reaching around 36 centimeters. I only made my chart up to 25 centimeters, so you may want to make a taller attachment for your chart. Let's look at how I've identified my feathers in the field. I am in Northern Virginia, out in some woods right now. Let's start with an easier one. I'll take three photos, one just of the feather on the ground, and two photos of the feather on my backdrop, front and back. Even though this feather is fairly similar looking on both sides, we can see there are differences and some species like a black vulture will have very different colors on the dorsal and ventral side of a feather. Now let's go over some basic feather vocab. The vein is what has the smooth surface composed of the interlocking, pinaceous barbs. The anterior vein is forward and generally smaller and the posterior vein is the trailing edge, generally larger. Pinaceous barbs are formed by the interlocking of barbules. Plumulaceous barbs are with barbules that are not interlocking, so the texture of down or fluff occurs. Some feathers will have both pinaceous and plumulaceous barbs, or just one and not the other. The shaft has two parts. The top part that has attached barbs is called the rachis. The plural of rachis is Rachides or Rachides. The bottom part of the shaft without attached barbs is called the calamus or quill. The plural of calamus is calami. And the Cornell Lab of Ornithology has a really cool uh, webpage dedicated to teaching about feathers. And I checked it out. I'm going to link that. You should check that out too. Also, I've created a page on Koa Nature's website, koa.org forward slash feather ID, that will also have all of these links and information in one spot. So now with our photos, we can go to Feather Atlas. And remember, they don't yet have an app for this that you can download onto your phone. So you'll just open up a web browser on your phone or back at your computer when you get home. Under the Feather Atlas's Identify Feather tool, we'll first click on Pattern and see a variety of options. You can click more than one, but I believe we'll just click Two-Tone for this one. Then we go click Next Selection to get to the next criterion choice. This takes us to Color. And I believe what's important here is you're not choosing what's the most abundant color on the feather, but what's the most striking or characteristic color, what stands out to you. And I'd say the yellow is definitely the striking characteristic of our feather. And we are only allowed to click one color option. Let's click next selection to get to size. This is why our chart is so handy. We can see this feather is just under 13 centimeters. And so that would fit under the medium option. Next selection takes us to position where for most of us we'll probably leave this blank until we get better at our feather placement identification. And the last criterion is type of bird. I know these woods very well and there's only one bird that is large enough to have a yellow feather like this but let's leave it blank and see what the database brings up. By clicking Find Similar Feathers, we will be taken to the choices available from the database that will meet all the criteria we submitted. And we have about five or six species show up. And let's also notice that the forensic scientists who worked on this were wonderful enough and diligent enough to notice that the undersides and uh, the top sides, those dorsal and ventral sides, were different enough to where they felt they needed to put in different uh, catalog arrays. So that's really cool. They did a wonderful job on this. But our feather most definitely looks like the northern flicker, and maybe even the gilded flicker. But the gilded flicker's feathers are too small, and the dark section isn't quite dark enough to match ours. Plus, I'm in northern Virginia, and not in the west coast range of the gilded flicker. But what if you don't know the natural range of these birds? And that's why I want to show you how we can cross-reference our findings with another database. Because we're not always 
going to know where the birds are migrating through, where they're hanging around. That's just one feature I think Feather Atlas really needs to add. You might have the application Merlin Bird ID, which is a great tool that I use all the time, but I want you to try using the iNaturalist application for a cross-reference because iNaturalist will offer you and me some other perks we can take advantage of later on. And iNaturalist is a magnificent tool for identifying animals and plants and fungi. It's free. Uh, you can use it on your smartphone or on your web browser at home. We're going to use this cross-referencing feature as we do our next feather. All right, looks like we have a little blue feather right here. So let's get our photos. Go to Feather Atlas and fill out what we know. We'll say this feather is without a pattern. Blue is definitely the characteristic color. It is smaller than eight centimeters. Click find similar feathers and we have a number of records show up. We can see that it's not a jay feather and probably not an indigo bunting feather. But each of these bluebird species looks like a match. So we want to figure out where the mountain bluebird, the western bluebird, and the eastern bluebird are all hanging out. So yeah, you could do this quickly with Merlin bird ID like I said, but iNaturalist is going to offer us another layer of support that Merlin bird ID just can't do. You'll see. So I'm first going to browse iNaturalist for the locations of each one of these species by clicking explore and then inserting our bird names into the species input form we'll examine where these birds are found. The western bluebird is definitely in the western part of North America. The mountain bluebird is also western, spreading a bit more central, and those lone spots in the east are probably misidentifications or maybe even wanderers. But yes, the eastern bluebird is in the east, and I'm in northern Virginia. But here is where the super awesome beneficial part comes in. Let's post this observation to iNaturalist. So we will upload the images, and we will drag these images on top of the photo we want to appear first to make it one observation. And always insert your location first before looking at the suggested species. If you are on a mobile phone and have location enabled, then it will automatically do that. But let's see. Huh. We aren't getting any bluebird suggestions. And now you're probably like, Koa, what's going on, man? You told me there was, there was going to be some super cool perk. Where is it? I'm not seeing it. It's okay. I got you. Bear with me. We are going to suggest that we believe this is an eastern bluebird. But if you are not comfortable making a specific ID suggestion, just put Aves. This is the class of birds within the kingdom of Animalia. This will help other bird experts find your observation. Just don't ever leave a suggestion box blank, even if you have to take it all the way to the kingdom of Animalia, because blank observations can get lost in the unknown category. But most importantly for what we're doing, put this ID in a project called Found Feathers. I will show you how to join this project in a minute. Placing this observation in Found Feathers will immediately link your observation to the feeds of feather experts and feather enthusiasts who have spent far more hours identifying bird feathers than you or I. Yes, there are people out there in the world wanting and willing to ID your bird feathers. You can easily join this project by clicking Community, followed by Projects, submit the words Found Feathers in the search field, then click on that project, and right where it says Leave This Project is where it would say Join This Project if you aren't yet a member, I am a member right now, so that's why it says leave this project instead of join this project. And you just give that a click, and you join this really cool project created by Amanda J, a.k.a. Feather Enthusiast. And I briefly browsed her website the other day at foundfeathers.org, and I found a wonderful poem prefaced with some powerful words about bird conservation. So I'm just going to give her an unendorsed plug at the bottom of this video, linking her 
poem at her website because she's an absolutely terrific writer and we are going to need far more intelligent, uh, well-spoken people like her in our future battles to protect wildlife, birds, and global ecosystems. So we give a big thanks to her and all those working on the Found Feathers project for making it a big success. And now that you've joined the project, when you click on projects when submitting observations, the Found Feather project should be there so you can easily put your observation into that project. So I actually submitted this observation days ago, and on that same day, two other members of the Found Feathers project confirmed my ID of Eastern Bluebird. And Karakaxa, I believe that's Greek, maybe, the leading species observer in this project even confirmed that it was a tail feather by assigning this observation a feather placement. The northern flicker feather we first went over also received three separate verifications for the ID. And we actually know that that was a yellow shafted flicker because obviously yellow shaft right there. And so we could maybe try and figure out the subspecies. I was kind of hoping one of the experts would do that, but maybe we'll have to do some more digging. I'm also going to provide the links to other databases you may cross-reference your findings against, one of them being Featherbase, which is a global project with over 1,400 species. It's quite large and has thousands of photos. It's German-based, so some of the info, even with the English selected, will still be in German. The last two feathers I found are not going to be so easy to identify. All right, here's a big one. So this one's probably a primary feather of a hawk. That'd be my guess. Okay, so in Feather Atlas, I will select the pattern as barred. For color, I will say brown. Because there is a rather dark shade of brown, that would seem to be the striking characteristic to my eye. And our feather is about 22 centimeters, so that is a large feather. Again, we will leave the position and type of bird unselected and hit find similar feathers. And holy sh- wow, 160 search results. Keep in mind those are 160 different feather arrays that are cataloged, not 160 different species. So you have your choices. If you were saying, hey, this is too much work, this is that my league? You can just go pop that observation in iNaturalist under Aves, which again is the class within Animalia we commonly call birds, and put it into the Project Found Feathers and let some experts do the work for you and take a gander. Or you can rise up to the challenge and see if you can unwind that feather mystery. I've chosen the latter. I'm seeing a lot of hawks, owls, and other raptor species. I'm just going to browse these selections, comparing it to my photos, and see what matches the closest. I found two species that have feathers very close to mine, the barred owl and the red-shouldered hawk. I have four photos from Feather Atlas with the tail feathers and primary feathers of each species. Immediately, I think we can toss out the tail feathers because we can tell that the calami, or the quills on the tail feathers, are too short compared to our feather. The barbs of the vein start higher up on our feather. So that leaves us with the primary feathers. The barred owl primaries are mostly too big. Plus there is a large white tip, and our feather has a rather lean white tip. And if we look at the red-shouldered hawk primaries, these two feathers here look very similar and match the size. In fact, I'm wondering if uh, we have the feather that is missing from this catalog entry. Submitting our entry into iNaturalist does bring up the red-shouldered hawk as one of the options. And I'm sure as more feathers are submitted and confirmed by experts, the iNaturalist AI software will be much better at its feather recognition. And later that day, a couple of members of the project confirmed the idea of a red-shouldered hawk, of which I do see almost every day in the woods. I just really love how technology can bring researchers, uh, enthusiasts, experts together for collaborations like this. It's really cool. Okay, so we're near some water. Here's a big feather. 
So there's one last feather to ID, and we'll add another Let's level of cross-referencing when we do this one. This is a big one. It hangs off the chart just above 25 centimeters. All right, you know the drill by now. We're first gonna start at Feather Atlas. For the pattern, I'm actually gonna choose Unpatterned because this feather's rather drab and not much is going on. Color-wise, gray is really what I'm seeing. There may be some blue, and maybe we're gonna have to do another search using blue instead of gray if no feathers pop up that we think fit. And of course, this counts as a huge feather being longer than 24 centimeters. We click find similar feathers. Okay, so we have 50 search results. We have geese, terns, herons, kites, lots of options. So again, I'm doing a bit of browsing through these feather options. Gray blue heron seems to be the closest fit, perhaps as a secondary feather. This is where our next level of cross-referencing comes in. Let's go to iNaturalist and browse the Found Feathers project database. There are over 20,000 observations in this project, so I'm sure they have something that could help. So at the iNaturalist homepage, we can click on Community and see our recent projects and just click on the Found Feathers project. And if it's not there, just go click on Projects and do the field submission with Found Feathers and click on that project. Now click on Species. This will bring up photos of all the species in this database. Scroll until you find the bird you're looking for, and don't click on the specific name, or the scientific name, and don't click on the common name. Click on the observations part. Now we have a lot of observations of this species to browse. And I'm more confident that we found a great blue heron feather after browsing these photos. And we'd also receive some confirmation IDs from the wonderful members of this project. And keep in mind that the people in the Found Feathers project won't always be able to ID what you have. Higher quality photos and accurate size and location information on your observation will help you get an ID. I really love filming the great blue heron in the woods when they are fishing in the creek and going after the tadpoles in the ephemeral ponds. I feel really happy to have found and identified this heron feather as well as the others. I always feel closer and more intertwined with wildlife when I learn more about it. This was pretty cool. And I look through the list of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act of 1918 and every single feather I found is protected under this act. And that should get you going on your quest to identify some feathers. If you liked the video, click the thumbs pointing up. Not my thumb. There's a thumb around there somewhere. That'll bookmark this video and make it easier for you to find if you ever want to reference it again or just say I like this video. Also, let's thank our patrons of Koei Nature because they toss Koei Nature a buck or more every month and let this spreading of knowledge really occur. So I thank you for watching. Best of luck identifying your feathers. Spread some knowledge. Be nature heroic. Bye. So while you're looking for feathers, you can also find four-leaf clover. Now, if you'll notice, there is another one right next to it. And always keep a lookout for more because they're often growing on the same plant. As you can see, it is the same stem. The shoot-off stems there but it's also producing three-leaf clover as well. Pretty cool. One time in Peru I found like eight all in a small area.